Uh, I want to take a moment uh, just to set the stage here. My name is Warren Maybe, and I'm the director of the School of Policy Studies here at Queen's University. I'm also an associate dean in the uh, Faculty of Arts and Science. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this session. Uh, this is the Thomas Plunkett uh, Lecture Series uh, on behalf of the School of Policy Studies and on behalf of the School of Urban and Regional Studies. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Before we get into our uh, lecture, I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that I'm sitting here at Queen's University and we are situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, it is a privilege to be able to work here and to study here and to learn here. Uh, the, the place of Cataraqui has always been a place where people come together to exchange ideas and thoughts. Uh, and I like to think that Queens carries on that tradition. Because we are in a virtual setting, you may be on many different traditional or um, uh, territories across the country. Uh, we can't acknowledge them all, but we can say, you know, think about those uh, people that have come before. Uh, and think about that relationship with the land as we go into our lecture today. Um, we are um, bringing you together for the Thomas Plunkett Lecture Series. Uh, Tom Plunkett was the director of the School of Public Administration here at Queen's University uh, in the 1970s and again in the 1990s. Uh, Tom uh, had served in the Air Force in World War II uh, after which he came back and received his master's in planning from McGill. He worked on planning issues uh, with munis municipalities right across Canada. Uh, and he worked overseas in places like Singapore and Guyana and China. Uh, the Thomas Plunkett Lecture Series uh, has been generously supported by family and friends of, of Tom. Uh, it supports the participation of distinguished senior practitioners in municipal government uh, in our schools, and schools being plural, uh, scholarly activities. We've had a number of wonderful speakers in the past, um, and we have a wonderful speaker for you here today. Uh, to introduce our speaker, I'd like to call on the Acting Director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning, uh, Professor Patricia Collins. Patricia, do you want to take the stage? Sure, thanks Warren, and thank you very much everyone for coming today uh, to this lecture series. As Warren said, my name is Patricia Collins and I'm the acting director uh, for the School of Urban and Regional Planning, uh, which is within the Department of uh, Geography and Planning at Queens. The School of Urban and Regional Planning is very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event uh, with the School of Policy Studies. Since 1970, our rigorous Master of Urban and Regional Planning program has equipped students uh, with the knowledge and skills they require to become leaders in the planning field and to meet the challenges of rapidly evolving urban environments across the country. A great number of our graduates move on to fulfilling careers within the public sector, particularly at the municipal level, and some have even worked closely with our respected guest during his mayoralty. As such, it's a great honor and delight to introduce the speaker for the 2022 Thomas Plunkett Lecture Series. Nahid Nanchi served as Calgary's mayor for three terms between 2010 and 2021. During his time, Calgary earned the distinction as the best city in which to live in the Western Hemisphere. As mayor, Mr. Nenshi led unprecedented investments in various public amenities, such, such as public transit and a new central library, while also providing critical leadership during multiple state, states of emergency. Nahid Nenshi was awarded the World Mayor Prize in 2014, and he is a recipient of the President's Award from the Canadian Institute of Planners. Mr. Nenshi is a graduate from the University of Calgary and has a Master of Public Policy degree from Harvard. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Nenshi this afternoon. There well, will be thunderous applause. The virtual now. clap. The virtual thunderous applause. There are a lot of people here today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Tansi, Uju, Amba Wastich. Dadana Stada, Size Etia. Oki nitugwa, nituano gabesto chipistus. So I'm coming to you today from my fully equipped home studio, also known as my dining room, because ain't nobody coming for dinner, uh, here on in a place that is very ancient, in a place that the Blackfoot call Mokinstis, 
the elbow, the place where two rivers come together. And I just attempted to mispronounce in five different Indigenous languages the common Indigenous greeting, greetings to all my relations. I love that greeting because it reminds us that we are indeed all part of the tapestry of this place. To my Sutina nation brothers and sisters, I'm known as Etia, always ready, which I always hasten to remind people does not actually mean always on time. And to my Blackfoot brothers and sisters, uh, Elder Pete standing alone in typical Siksikastepi sense of humor gave me a name I cannot pronounce. Uh, recently, just the day after the election, I was still mayor for another week, but the day after the election, we had a surprise ceremony, which was an extraordinary thing in which I was gifted with a war bonnet, uh, a traditional indigenous headdress, and was told that I am now a warrior for the indigenous peoples. And I was very happy to take that on, but I was most happy at that event uh, because the elder also could not pronounce my name. Um, so it's not just me uh, who has an, who uh, cannot make it through that name. It means clan leader, he who moves camp and the others follow. And it's those distinctions, those names are honors that I take very seriously because to me, they really talk about my job, but all of our jobs in building towards a nation of true reconciliation, or as my friend Casey Eagle speaker told me last summer, I never want to hear you say reconciliation again. I want you to hear you talk about reconciliation and the job that every one of us has in terms of taking action in these areas. It's a great pleasure for me too, to be here with you virtually at Queens. I'm very used to being at Queens in January. Um, through my undergraduate degree, I spent a lot of time at the Intercollegiate Business Competition. And so it's nice to have a little bit of a homecoming, uh, even if it is entirely virtual. And as you heard, um, I've been very lucky to have a number of Queens alumni uh, working with me. Uh, my senior policy advisor and planning, my chief of staff are both graduates of the School of Urban Regional Planning. And uh, I am also joined today, in fact, she's here with us uh, by my colleague, Nancy Close, uh, our community relations coordinator and newly elected school board trustee for the Calgary Board of Education. She picked an easy time to get back into elected office. Um, running a school board at this moment, mm, not fun. Uh, but thanks for being here uh, with us, Nancy. So I am so happy to be here with you today. Uh, especially in this lecture named after the great Thomas Plunkett, to talk about urban issues, but not really. What I want to spend some time with you today is to talk about human issues. And so I will highlight for all of you and those of you in the School of uh, Urban and Regional Planning will already know this, but for the rest of you, I want to highlight that for many reasons, we are living in a moment unprecedented in human history. For the first time in human history, the majority of beings on this planet live in cities. That has never happened before. The majority of humanity has always lived a rural or an agrarian lifestyle. And this relentless pace of urbanization will continue. It is anticipated that by the end of this decade, but certainly by the end of the next decade, some two thirds of humanity will live in cities. That means that urban issues are indeed human issues. Understanding how we deal with some of the oldest questions of humanity are questions that have to deal with how we deal with cities. And right now I believe that we are obsessed though we don't really talk about it very much with the oldest question of humanity. And that question is, how do we live together? How do we live together and what do we do to ensure that we can live lives of quality and of dignity together? Now, I want you to take a little mental journey with me here. And I want you to think about every tourism ad for Canada you've ever seen. And I want you to think about the images that come up in those ads. 
you see images of the part of the country that I'm lucky enough to live in. You'll see mountains and lakes and elk. You'll see fields and endless sky of the prairies, also a place I'm lucky enough to live in. You'll see the rugged terrain of the Canadian Shield. You'll see people in canoes. And a lot of that is how we think of ourselves as a country, rugged, outdoorsy, rural. But indeed, Canada is one of the most urbanized nations on earth. When you take away city-states like Singapore, you'll find that Canada is at the very top of the league in terms of the number of people who live in cities. Some 80% of us live in cities in this country. And Professor Gordon would argue and say, we're not an urban nation, we're a suburban nation. And if this were a real academic lecture, I would get into it with him and say, that's a distinction without a difference, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that despite that, we don't have a minister of urban affairs in the federal government. When the newly um, named Premier of Alberta some years ago, not the current Premier, but when the newly named Premier of Alberta some years ago came to the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, that's the mayors and the councillors of all the cities and towns in Alberta, he started with a really striking, beautiful video montage of the province music and pictures and none of the pictures in that three minute video were pictures of people together, let alone pictures of cities. So the myth that we tell ourselves is not truly the reality of how this country works. And I believe that at this moment, we are facing five simultaneous crises, any one of which would bring a lesser community to its knees. And those five crises are, of course, a public health crisis and the pandemic, a crisis of mental health and addiction. It was here before, but it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. An economic crisis where we are struggling to really understand what it means to have decent work and live a decent life. Of course, an environmental crisis and the climate emergency and a crisis around what I term as equity. We've learned a lot over the last two years about what it takes to build a community. And part of that really has been around what does it mean to achieve true gender equality? What does it mean to move from multicultural and pluralism to actual anti-racism? What does it mean, and this is very, very unfashionable, but I've never been accused of being fashionable, what does it mean that we built a society with such increasing amounts of income inequity? And what does that mean for people's ability to live a good life here in this society? So these are all critical questions that we have to address. And I'm going to come back to them over the course of our conversation today. But I thought before I go there, I would tell you a little bit about how I came to be an urbanist. So first of all, I am uh, someone who loves cities, someone who has always loved cities. And I've rarely gone on a beach vacation. If I get the chance to go on holiday, I wanna to go to a big city. I wanna take transit from the airport, much to the chagrin of the people I'm traveling with usually. And I wanna figure out how the city works and I wanna feel the heartbeat of that city. Some years ago, my last period of unemployment before this period of unemployment, I was connected with another Queens alumna, a woman called Alison Lotes, who if you don't know Alison Lote and her work, you should know Alison Lote and her work. She's a pretty incredible person. Uh, but Alison at that time was running an organization called Canada 25, which was all about getting young people more engaged in the future of their communities. And every year, Canada 25 would choose a policy topic to use as kind of a, an excuse to get people talking about the future of the nation and of our communities. And at that time, the topic was Canada's cities. And since I was unemployed, Allison asked me if I would help out. And out of that, I ended up writing a little book. The book was called Building Up, Making Canada's Cities Magnets for Talent and Engines of Development. 
I didn't write this by myself. It was the culmination of a bunch of people's work. But we talked about three critical aspects of how a city needs to work together or how a city needs to succeed, I should say. They all started with the letter D because I was being clever. So the first one was density and how you need to have a critical mass of people living in a way that is respectful of the natural and built environment, but being able to run into one another, being able to see one another, being able to collide with ideas. So density. The second is diversity. Diversity in cities and in neighborhoods, diversity in income, in age, in ethnicity, in background, and how having different kinds of people interacting with one another was so critical. And the third was a sense of discovery. And that means two things. The first is the discovery that comes through creativity in the arts and being able to tell stories about ourselves. And the second is around economic development and how we craft innovation in the community. So coming out of those three Ds, density, diversity, and a sense of discovery, there were a number of areas where we felt that work needed to happen. There were eight of them, as a matter of fact. And those were fighting urban sprawl, creating a new national transportation and transit strategy, building great city universities and the linkages between universities and cities, tuning up the city economic development engine to create more innovative economies, more innovative urban economies, maximizing the benefits of immigration, fighting urban poverty, fostering creativity and supporting the arts, and measuring our success. Now, so I'm telling you all about the stuff that I wrote down in 2001, 20 years ago. And the reason I'm telling you about it is because I recently went back to this thing, having kind of forgotten about it. And thankfully, somebody had it on the internet because I don't think I have a copy. And I was looking through it. And I realized that in my 11 years as mayor, that was pretty much a list of the things I worked on. There's one thing missing, mental health. Well, health in general, public health, we never thought that would be a big deal in mental health, as well as disaster mitigation and resilience. But by and large, those are the things that I worked on all of those years, because I think they are in some ways timeless. They are really stories about what we need to do and what we may never finish um, as part of the important work that we're doing on building better cities in our communities. So where are we now? As I mentioned, the pandemic has really upended our expectations of what a city is and what society is and what our community is. I was at the beginning of 2020, two years ago, planning my year. And it was gonna be a year of an enormous amount of travel. Uh, I had big plans to go around the world and tell the story of Calgary, do a bunch of business development stuff. And in the first eight weeks of 2020, I had stayed in seven different hotels in seven different cities. I was in India for the first time in my life on an economic development trade mission in the last week of February and the first, actually in the first week of March. I landed back here in Calgary on March the 8th, which was a Sunday. While I was in India, I had been thinking, what a shame that I have to get back so quickly, but I only have 24 hours in Calgary before I have to turn around and go to a conference in Houston. And I'm probably the first person, uh, you know, in the last thousand years to have visited India and never seen the Taj Mahal. So while I was in India, the conference I was supposed to go in Houston got canceled. It was the first international conference to get canceled. And I thought, geez, I can stay here. I can go see the Taj Mahal. And the virus was sort of chasing us. When we had left, there were fewer cases in India, a country of 1.1 billion people, than there were in Canada, a country of 34 million people. So we were okay. But then things changed. And because I'm a procrastinator, I never got around to changing my ticket so I could go see the Taj Mahal. And thankfully I didn't because they closed the Taj Mahal while I was there. 
I landed back in Calgary on September the 8th, uh, on March the 8th, which was a Sunday. The next day on Monday, I was at City Hall and I was doing a press scrum as I do every day. And they asked me about the virus. And I remember saying, you know, I'm starting to get a little concerned about this thing. So everyone, you know, have good hygiene, stop shaking hands. Remember when we used to do that? Um, And I made a joke. I still remember. I said, as the mayor, I'm telling you, I've just been in India. And in India, they don't shake hands. They say namaste. So in Calgary, from now on, we're going to say namaste. That was Monday. Wednesday, the NBA canceled its season a minute before a game was to start in Oklahoma. On Thursday, the NHL canceled its season. On Saturday, we declared the second ever state of local emergency in Calgary's history. And everything changed forever. It happened that fast. And I remember early in the pandemic, we were talking about the question of masks. And we were saying, you know what? I don't think people in Canada will ever wear masks. That's weird. Only people in East Asia wear masks. And we hesitate. We didn't hesitate on a lot. We moved very quickly. But we hesitated a little bit on that question because we weren't sure people were going to do it. Can you imagine? That was just two years ago. And now I'm sure you, like me, are shocked when you see someone not wearing a mask. And so things have changed very significantly. Teachers here in Alberta had to learn to be online teachers over a weekend. We had to figure out new ways of learning, new ways of working. Story I often tell is that at the city of Calgary, at the middle of February, the IT department just started rolling out this new collaborative software called Microsoft Teams. No one had it yet. No one knew how to use it. And it wasn't being rolled out for video conference purposes. It was being rolled out for its collaborative team purposes, which I've never used, but apparently are good. And over the course of the weekend, that weekend, our IT department had to deploy Microsoft Teams to 5,000 desks over a weekend. Well, there weren't desks because people took their computers home. And by the Tuesday, we had over 20,000 hours of simultaneous Microsoft Teams meetings happening at once. So what did we learn from all that? We learned that people are resilient. We learned that people can change. But more important than that, we learned that our assumptions about the world can be upended this quickly. That we have to find out new ways of doing things. One of the very best things about the pandemic for me is that I got to visit a lot more schools virtually. I got to spend a lot of time in classrooms on screens, either while they were were learning online or while they were in their classroom and I was on a screen. And I always ask the kids the same question, whether they were kindergarten or grade 12. And so I always started as an icebreaker by saying, what have you learned from the pandemic? What has COVID taught you? And what was interesting is that I always heard the same things. One person would always say, usually a boy, would always say, I learned how gross we are. And I'd say, what do you mean by that? And he's like, we never washed our hands. We touched everything. And I've learned that was disgusting. I'm like, okay, good. Keep that lesson. But more important, a student would always come up with a word that I didn't know young people knew. And I've had a kindergarten kid say this to me, and I've had a grade 12 kid say it to me. I've had university students say it to me. I learned to be more resilient. And I would always say, what does that mean? And they'd say, well, I learned not to take anything for granted. I learned to value the things that are important. I learned that I'm capable of doing things that I didn't think I was capable of. And I learned that if I can focus on the things that really matter, I can put one foot in front of the other and move forward. And so many times I've thought to myself, I wish grownups would be that, would learn those lessons. I wish grownups would be that resilient. I wish the people marching in the streets would be that resilient. That's a very sunny view of what we learned. But I also learned something. I learned a lot of things. But I learned something that wasn't so sunny. 
You see, through my history, I have always been focused on a very simple concept. And that is that my, it's my political philosophy. People always ask me, are you left wing or are you right wing or are you liberal or are you conservative? And I always say, I wear purple every day. And I still wear purple every day. And the reason I wear purple every day is because purple is red and blue. Because I'm trying to show folks that we aren't defined by our ideology, we're defined by our humanity. And we can work together to fix things. But I do have a political philosophy. And my political philosophy is people are good and people are smart. And when you give citizens the right information, they will invariably do the right thing. And so what shook me in the later days of the pandemic was the number of people who could not conceive of making the smallest sacrifice in order to achieve the greater good for others. This surprised me. People who wouldn't put a piece of cloth over their face to try and keep others healthy because it was an infringement on their freedom. I wanna highlight that this is a tiny, 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 tiny minority of people. That the vast majority of people are interested in looking after not just themselves, but their families and their community. And the way we see that, by the way, is in the vaccine statistics. As soon as we lowered the barriers to access to vaccination in cities in Canada, we got figures of above 90, 95% of people doing the right thing by getting vaccinated. So we know that the vast majority of people want to build a better community. But this tiny minority somehow has grabbed the megaphone. And even politically, far too many politicians have been coddling this kind of selfishness rather than building greater communities. And that's something that frustrates me. And I think our political system needs to grow bigger, not bigger government, but a bigger minded political system to actually think about all of the issues that we're facing together as communities and as cities. Which brings me back to the five simultaneous crises. So let's start with the first one, public health. The pandemic has really shown us that in many ways, the ways that we think about cities and how cities work may or may not be the things that will carry us into the future. So as more and more people work from home, does that mean that cities that are designed to funnel workers in and out of central business districts, our transit systems are designed that way? will continue to work. You know, Toronto had the biggest problem of any Canadian city financially during the pandemic. And that is precisely because Toronto is the most successful city in North America in terms of its transit system. In most mid-sized to large cities, about 50% of your transit budget is covered by the fares people pay and 50% is a subsidy from property taxes. In Toronto, about 80% is covered by the fare box and every city is, strives for that. But when the pandemic happened, of course, nobody was paying fares because nobody was riding and Toronto's entire civic budget was in jeopardy as a result. They were a victim of their own success. And so what does that mean for transit going forward? Here in Calgary, we are operating uh, until Omicron, we were operating at about 85% of service levels from pre-pandemic levels to fit about 35% of ridership. Are those riders going to come back when they go back to work? What can we do to build transit systems to entice them to come back? How do we deal with issues around convenience and value, but particularly around safety as we move forward? The other really important thing that the pandemic has laid bare in terms of urban planning has to do with public, dis public disorder and safety. Downtown Calgary today is a very different place than it was two years ago. And for a lot of folks, the perception is it's much less safe because the kind of social disorder that can happen in cities, because cities are inequitable almost by definition, people of different income levels come to cities are much more concentrated and much more acute. Very vulnerable people acting out often in ways that feel unsafe. 
And so does that mean people won't want to come back downtown? Does that mean that people will want to be in their own car rather than on public transit? These are really important issues that cities have to face, and I don't know the answers. I don't know what the future of work is going to look like. But this public health pandemic, again, has really forced us to rethink how cities work. Second, mental health and addiction. Far more people in most of Canada, far more people died of overdose than died of COVID in the last two years. And that's just the most pointy end, the most extreme end of the mental health and addictions crisis that we face. Long before the pandemic, I had decided that my third term as mayor would be focused on mental health and addiction and that we would create Canada's first community-based action plan on mental health and addiction, which my colleague Nancy Close, Queen's alumna, uh, spearheaded for us. And we did that. You can check it out at calgary.ca. It's called A Community of Connections. And it's based on three basic principles. One is being well. And I need to remind everyone that mental health and addiction is not about the person overdosing on the street. One in four of us will be diagnosed with mental illness at some point in our lives. Four out of four of us will struggle with our mental health at some point in our lives. That means in every family today, there is someone struggling with a diagnosis of mental health, or mental illness, I should say. And every one of us, especially in this pandemic, are struggling with our own mental health. And we never talk about it, except on Bell Let's Talk Day. So it's really important that we create a society where people can stay well, whether at home, at school, at work, or in the community, in their faith communities. The second is getting help when, where, and how you need it. And that's really about fixing the system to ensure that people have access to the services they need to recover. And then the third is staying safe. Whether you're someone in mental health distress or someone experiencing others in mental health distress in the community and how we can ensure that everyone feels the community is a place they can be safe. There's a lot of work to do there. And we have an enormous amount of work in front of us in order to make sure that everyone can live a life of dignity. The third is the economic crisis. In the early days of the pandemic, we were, for too many of us, introduced for the first time to a group of people in our communities. They wake up very early in the morning, they get on the bus, they go to their job at a long-term care center where they wake up our parents and grandparents, change their diapers, get them ready for breakfast and work with them until lunchtime. After lunch, because the private operator of the long-term care center doesn't wanna pay them benefits, so doesn't give them full-time hours. After lunch, they take another bus across town to their second job at a different long-term care center and do the same for the supper break. Then they come home late, hopefully get to see their own kids before they go to bed, go to bed and start this whole thing the next day again. They're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and they're barely making enough to get by. Almost all of them are women. Almost all of them are racialized women. And the way in which they are living their lives was a result of policy choices that we have made. We've chosen to create a stratified society in this way. And that's why I said it's unfashionable for us to talk about income inequity, but we have to come to terms now with what it means to have decent work. Whether we can agree on a principle that if people work hard, they should deserve to have a decent quality of life. They should be able to have decent housing. They should be able to have a decent way of living and access to services, public and private, to be able to live their lives well. And so we have to come to terms with that, especially as the economy shifts and changes and the nature of work changes. Look, I was very lucky during the pandemic. I get to work at home. I got a computer. I've got internet. I've got quiet spaces. In fact, because I wasn't going out, I probably did better financially during the pandemic than I was doing before. It's not the case for everyone. And it's really important for us to understand that the inequities within our system are growing and growing. 400 new billionaires created since the pandemic. 
And that's not a left wing or a right wing statement. It's a statement about stability of community and how we need to ensure people can partake in these opportunities. And in particular, if people who work in service cannot afford to live in the cities in which they work, in which they serve, and I can go on in the questions. If people like about housing, I have a lot to say about housing. Um, but this is a crisis for Canada. And I don't think any of us, particularly any politicians, have truly grasped how deep this crisis is and what it means. The fourth, of course, is the climate catastrophe, but not just the climate catastrophe. Our need to be able to steward our air, land, and water in ways that are more thoughtful because future generations will never forgive us if we don't. Um, I won't go on too much about that. I anticipate there'll be some questions about it, but I will say that all of the decisions we make in the other areas have to be taken with a climate lens, have to be taken with an environmental lens. And that's everything for cities, everything from building codes to transportation networks, to electricity generation and fortifying our electricity grids. These are all incredibly important pieces of the work we're doing. But the fifth one is the one that I really wanna spend my last few minutes on today. And that is what I call broadly the issue of equity. And part of it has to do with what I talked about earlier, income and equity but there's much more to it. In the summer of 2020, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, in the wake of Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter movements and protests across the country, we at the city of Calgary did something that we'd never done before, which is we invited the public to an unprecedented public hearing of city council at which we just asked them to tell their stories, to tell their stories of racism, of growing up in Calgary of their own communities. And I sat there and I listened to all of these stories and I was not particularly surprised by anything I heard. And I looked around and I realized that three of my colleagues on council were also not particularly surprised by anything they heard. In the long history of Calgary, 136 years, until this council was just elected last October, in 136 years, there were seven non-white members of council who served, seven visibly non-white members, four of whom served on my previous council. Five serve now, by the way. But, so the four of us were not that surprised because these were stories that we had lived. And I looked around and I realized the other 11 people around the table were shocked because this was not their reality. So my white colleagues, bless their hearts, had no idea that racism still existed in Calgary at the extent that we were hearing. But then I asked myself, is it wrong that I'm not shocked? After all, I'm pretty old. And if 20 year olds today are telling stories about the way they're treated in a store or in a bar that are the same as the stories we told when I was 20, which is a lot of years ago, doesn't that mean something? Doesn't that mean that we haven't gone where we need to go? This was very hard for me because I am such a proud Canadian. I've spent so much of my life talking about how the Aga Khan calls Canada something like the most successful pluralistic experiment in human history. I've talked a lot about a guy who looks like me, who worships like me, can become the mayor of a large city. I was the first Muslim mayor of any major city in the Western Hemisphere before Sadiq Khan, as I'm forever reminding people in London. And you know, that can happen in Canada because Canada's perfect and great. And so it was very, very hard for me to reconcile the fact that I am and we should be, and it is right to be proud of the pluralistic multicultural society that we built here, but also understand that there's a long way to go towards true anti-racism. And here's the thing, I don't know what anti-racism means. I can't define it. And I don't know what the journey is to get from here to there, but I know we have to make the journey. 
Which brings me to the last couple of things I'll mention before we get into more of a conversation. As I said, I've spent a lot of time with kids, with students over the last year. And I wanna tell you about two of the most impactful conversations I had. One was with a group of grade 12 students, Western Canada High School, one of the greatest public schools in Canada. These kids have limitless opportunities and potential in front of them. They get to go to school in downtown Calgary every day. And I asked them about their experiences in the context of anti-racism. And the most interesting part was when I asked a question to these kids, I said, you know, you're all what, 16, 17 years old? And I said, yeah. And I said, so how many of you have just gotten your driver's license? And despite popular uh, perception being young people don't get their driver's licenses anymore, a lot of them had just gotten their driver's license. So I picked on one of the students and I said, tell me about the lecture your parents gave you when you got your license. And he said, well, don't speed, don't drink and drive, don't do drugs and drive. And of course, as if I ever do any of those things, put your phone in the back seat. don't text and drive. And if you get a scratch on my car, God help you when you get home. And I said, okay, great. Same lecture I got all those years ago. And I turned to another student and I said, what lecture did you get? And she said, well, I got the same thing, but there's more. And I said, uh-huh, say. And she said, Always take your wallet out before you start driving and leave it in a place that's visible. So that if you have to reach for your license, you're not making any sudden movements. No matter how unfair it is, if the officer asks you to get out of the car, get out of the car. Do whatever they say. Do not resist. You can fight about it when you get home, but you got to get home. In Calgary, in a place where we have an incredibly progressive police service, where the chief has acknowledged the history of institutional and systemic racism in policing in his service and in Canada. Parents still give their kids that lecture. I got that lecture all those years ago. And so as we explored this further, and of course, if you didn't catch it, the first student was white, the second student was black. And it made me think that as racialized people in this country, we have an unspoken deal that we have made that we very rarely will say. And the deal is we'll put up with it. We'll put up with the extra attention from the security guard at the mall, even though he looks like us. We'll put up with, oh, but you speak English really well. We'll put up with, how do you pronounce your name? We'll put up with, no, where are you really from? And we put up with it because in return, we get to live here. We get to live in a place of boundless opportunity. And for a lot of young people in particular, they're saying, you know what? You made that deal. My parents made that deal. My grandparents made that deal. I want to make that deal. But the second moment that I had with some teenagers, which just happened recently, we were talking about trans rights. And one of the students was talking about how they changed their pronouns. To they and them. And it reminded me of a story from a few years ago when I was speaking at a tough inner city school in Winnipeg, an inner city high school. And a student asked me a question about how they could get more involved in politics. And I went off and I said, I love that you asked me that question. And I love that a young woman asked me that question because I want to get more women involved in politics. And I'm thrilled that you asked. And I sort of went on for a while. And the student interrupted me. And she said, she said, why would you assume I'm a woman? I don't identify as a woman. I identify as gender fluid. My pronouns are they and them. And in this tough inner city Winnipeg school, 
they got a standing ovation. And I thought to myself, wow, that is not what it was like when I was in high school. And maybe for this person, school is actually the safest place for them instead of the most unsafe place. So I raised, I told this story to these students just last week uh, here in Calgary. And one of the students put up their hand and said, no, you, you misunderstood. It's not because the school is necessarily safe. It's because people are willing to listen. And by the way, that student probably wasn't that offended that you misgendered them because you apologized. And so much of this is just about being nice to one another and understanding that we come from different places. And in the end, that is truly what really matters. Throughout the whole pandemic, I had a couple of catchphrases. One was clean hands, clear heads, open hearts. And the other was get vaccinated, wear a mask, be kind always. And it may sound soft, but the more I think about it, the more I realize that the secret to getting cities right, the secret to getting communities right is in that very simple kernel of kindness, of empathy, of mercy, of compassion, of love. Those are the things that really matter. So I don't know what the solutions are. I don't know how we fix these problems, but I know where the solutions can be found. And they can be found in that kernel of humanity. And more specifically, they can be found in our own service. Everyone in Calgary who's listened to me talk for 11 years knows one word in Sanskrit. And that word is seva. It means service. It means selfless service. And just before we started here, I managed to knock over my entire backdrop and the painting off the wall because I was trying to put up a different backdrop, which I've got right here, but I will not show to you, which is a giant foam number three, which belongs to my colleague Nancy Close, who's with us, but I stole it when we left the office. And the number three uh, is about a program I started at the beginning of my term as mayor. Nancy actually was the one who led it, called Three Things for Calgary and for Canada's 150th anniversary in 2017, we made it national. Three Things for Canada. And all it is, is very simple, that every single one of us as citizens should strive to do at least three acts of community service every year. It could be something small, shovel your neighbor's walk. Did you see that wonderful kid in Toronto on the news the other day? Um, it just had his name and said exhausted underneath. It could be something that small. It could be join the board of a nonprofit organization. It could be do something in your workplace or in your school to move towards anti-racism. It doesn't matter if it's big or small. What matters is that it's service. And if every one of us is able to do three acts of community service every year, that's 300 million acts of seva in our country every year. And that's where we get to the solution. Because there's one thing I know for sure. It's that even in these divided times, even in these hyper-partisan times, even in these times of crazy rhetoric, what we know from history and what we know from humanity is that anger and mean-spiritedness never, ever win. That divisiveness never wins. That ultimately kindness and compassion and mercy and love always win. And if we can express those things through our service, if we can understand that the promise of our community is, as I've been saying for a decade and a half, that regardless of what you look like, regardless of where you come from, regardless of how you worship, regardless of whom you love, you belong here. You deserve to be safe here. You deserve to be well here. And you deserve to live a life of dignity and prosperity right here. So for 11 years of my life, I had the chance to do that in public office to build that promise of our community, but every single one of us has the chance to do that every day. And ultimately that is how we build an even better society. So thank you all. I've gone on too long as I always do, but I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nenshi. You know that the real uh, 
crime of Zoom is that you can't hear the applause <laughs> that's coming to you from all across the country. This was inspiring and uplifting and uh, full of so many ideas. Uh, I already see that we have a number of questions open. I'm gonna remind everybody online that we have a Q&A function. It's at the bottom of your screen and you can pose questions there. Professor Collins and I are gonna take turns posing questions. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Nenshi. So I'm gonna start off. Um, we had an early question from Florence. Uh, she writes, uh, in Ontario, historically public health has received less than 5% of the provincial healthcare budget. Do you think the pandemic will bring about substantial change in how governments view the importance of public health or will the money just keep going to the hospitals as it has in the past? Well, this is a question a little over my pay grade, um, but I'm happy to take a stab at it. The, by the way, in Alberta, this is interesting, in Ontario, public health is a municipal responsibility. And in Alberta, it's a provincial responsibility. So at the city, we do not have a public health department. Um, over the course of the last two years, I sorely wished we had one at many times. But one of the challenges we've got with our healthcare system is that we really are not focused on prevention and on keeping people out of the system. And the inflation in the hospital system is such that it will always be relentless. There's very little you can do to control that. And yet we never actually have been able to, from a policy perspective, take a real prevention approach. And that's part of, for example, our mental health strategy. And it really is about keeping people from falling into a situation where they need acute care. That's also the same for our poverty um, strategy in Calgary, which is about preventing people from falling into homelessness, as well as helping people who are in that situation, for an example. So this focus on prevention is not very sexy, and it's hard for politicians and policymakers to really go that way because you don't have immediate results. You can't say, if I focused in public health today, that actually allowed me to reduce my hospital budget by 3% next year. But you know, one of the themes that I often talk about is how our institutions have become too small to, um, to manage the big problems. And part of that is our inability to conceive of how investments now can lead to long-term benefit. We've fallen into this short-term thinking, and I think we need to get out of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in now. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question here from uh, a current SERP student, Stephanie Cantlay, um, and she's curious about uh, the implications of the cost-sharing agreement between Calgary and, uh, and, and Calgary's NHL team in terms of uh, the livelihoods of low-income Calgarians. Can you speak to sort of the equity implications of that kind of arrangement? Oh, it's a good question. It's a very thoughtful question. So at the moment, of course, there is no deal between Calgary and its NHL team. I'm a little disappointed about that. I thought I had solved that problem. Um, but, you know, that is actually a question that we had a lot while we were having that conversation, which is, as I have said many, many times, public dollars must go to public benefit. And, you know, is there public benefit in building a facility that many Calgarians would never be able to afford to attend? And a lot of governments have solved that through, well, we'll have open days or the city will have 10 days where we can program public events in the, in the arena. And, and that's not good enough for me. For me, we had really had to see something that had broad benefit for the community as a whole. And remember, the community also includes high income people who can afford to go to the games and they deserve to have some public benefit um, as well. But ultimately, this was really my biggest challenge was when we built the public library, for example, and if uh, you haven't been to Calgary lately, uh, next time you come, make sure you see our new number one tourist attraction, which is our new central library, which is an extraordinary place. And, you know, when I opened that library, uh, I remember saying that people sometimes ask me, why did it have to be so beautiful? And my answer was because the library is one of the few places in our society that's open to everyone without cost, where everyone is welcome and everyone deserves to be in a beautiful place. Everyone deserves beauty. And my dream for that place was that a recently arrived refugee would walk in and sit down in a carol, maybe next to the mayor, because it is for everybody, and would look around and say, is this place for me? 
And the answer would be, yeah, because it's for everybody. And so getting back to the arena, look, it is very clear from an academic perspective and from an economic perspective that these investments very rarely pay off financially for governments, if ever. But that's not necessarily the right way to think about it, because we invest in a lot of things that don't have financial return, but they do have social return. And so one of the really critical things that we were trying to think through with the flames, and I got to say, they were pretty honorable about it. There were a few moments where, you know, we disagreed and they got a bit silly, um, but I'm sure they thought we got a bit silly too. But by and large, we very honorably were having a conversation about what can this do to make the community better? And the investment that we were really looking at was, and for those urban planners who are watching, was really focused on what can we do to use this arena as a cornerstone investment in the revitalization of a long neglected neighborhood. And it's very easy to get that wrong. Very easy to have an event center that's just for the events. And maybe there'll, it'll add a couple of sports bars and that's it. But could we actually conceive of this as a place where even if you didn't go inside it, the public realm was exciting and interesting and valuable. So for those of you who see Lansdowne Park in Ottawa, I wanted to do that times, 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 right? So the idea being that you don't necessarily have to go to a game to appreciate the cultural and recreational and social spinoffs of that place. And I thought we had it pretty much right, but now the new mayor and council get to see if they can get it better. And, I, and I'm actually very confident that given the way the world has changed and the pandemic has changed how we're thinking about things, that they'll be able to do it. Oh, I forgot to mention that. Sorry, I skipped a little bit in my speech here. So this is actually important and I want to highlight it. I said several times the pandemic has upended all of our assumptions. I didn't finish the thought. And the thought is, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. So when I was an undergraduate, I had a professor called Ron Glassberg, still teaches at the University of Calgary. And I wasn't a very good student, so I'm probably misquoting him but he would talk about the cyclical nature of time. And he talked about how times of great tension can be followed by times of transcendence. So I believe the fact that we've upended all our assumptions, whether about an arena or anything else, actually means that we have the opportunity in front of us to be in a time of extraordinary creativity, where we can actually build something, you know, build back better is the cliche, but where we can build something that is extraordinary. And that wouldn't have been possible without the pandemic. So in terms of the arena, I think they'll get it. I think they'll come up with a better deal than I came up with because their assumptions are different. But I also believe that that is true of everything we're working on right now. And if we include equity lenses and we include climate lenses um, in the work that we're doing, and I would like to say mental health and public health lenses, then we will actually be able to create something really special. And I'm very optimistic we'll get there. Thanks so much for that. I'm gonna read you a comment and then I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, the comment comes from Angela, who I think might be from Calgary. Uh, and they write, here, here, compassion and respect are the pillars of equitable, just, inclusive societies. Uh, that was a really nice comment. I just wanted you to hear it. Um, the question comes from Lisa who writes, I'd love to hear you elaborate on the housing crisis. What solutions uh -huh. do you see? Short how much time have we got? <laughs> Who needs to take action and how? I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> All right, so this is indeed a crisis. And I was very happy in this last mm -hmm. federal election to see that housing was a very major issue. Now, I will tell you it was approached from a different angle than I would have approached it because each of the parties was really approaching it from the affordability crisis that we're seeing basically in Toronto and Vancouver and now a little bit in Ottawa, um, which is not in fact the case across the country. And the issue of dignified housing is really important. By the way, for those of you who are watching across the country, old habits die hard. So I will tell you that I am sitting here in my dining room in my very nice 2000 square foot house um, in a very nice neighborhood, 20 minutes to downtown on the train, 
uh, 25 if you're driving during rush hour. Uh, and my assessment was $460,000 this year. So uh, Calgary is available. Uh, please feel free to move here. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, that said, of course, there is still issues around um, the criticality of making sure people have dignified places to live. And I think part of the challenge that we have had is that housing is a municipal, a provincial, and a federal responsibility under our system. And so as a result, we get to play the best Canadian game, pass the buck. And as a result, no, nothing ever gets done. And so I'll give you an example of what happened during the pandemic which is the mayor of Edmonton, Don Iveson, the former mayor of Edmonton and I, really were thinking about housing and we realized that there was a very, very narrow window of opportunity to do something incredible. Because in Calgary and Edmonton, so the vacancy rates were so high, we had a lot of uh, multifamily condos and so on coming on the market. And we had a lot of hoteliers worried about the future of the hospitality sector who wanted to exit the business. So we had a very rare moment. And with the community in Calgary, we were able to put together a really remarkable opportunity where we said with a relatively modest investment of $500 million from the provincial and federal governments and ongoing operating funding of just about $2 million a year from the provincial government for wraparound services, the Prime Minister could go to the United Nations General Assembly in September 2022 and say Canada has ended homelessness in two of its largest cities. We had that opportunity. And to his credit, Minister Ahmed Hussein, who is now the Minister of Housing federally, took this on. But then it went to Ottawa. And things happen when things go to Ottawa. And what became the Rapid Housing Initiative became a national program where everybody got a few drops. And I'm not complaining, we managed to build three, 400 units of housing in Calgary. From that, we need 5,000. And the amount of money that Toronto or Vancouver got did very little to help their very significant problems. And so that was actually a real eye-opener for me because for me, a homeless person is a homeless person. And if you can, if you can actually house a thousand homeless people for the same amount of money as a hundred homeless people, house the thousand. It doesn't matter where they are geographically. And people will move, right? Um, but we weren't able to do that. And it was kind of a crisis of imagination as far as I'm concerned. There's also some technical issues. So for example, the projects that Calgary put forward, none of them involved ongoing operating funding because our provincial government's just not in that headspace. So they were all mixed income models where some people are paying market rent or close to market rent and others are paying subsidized rent. So the, the market rent people subsidize the others and every mixed income model in the country was rejected by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation because they found them too risky and they wanted more traditional government backstops. It's not gonna work. If government has to build every unit of affordable housing and subsidize them, we're never gonna have the money to build the 5,000 units we need in Calgary. So we need more imagination. And I will say that I watched, one of the good things about the pandemic is there's lots of streaming. So I watched a movie at the Toronto Film Festival, even though I wasn't in Toronto, about the redevelopment at the Honest Ed site at Bloor and Bathurst. And in the middle of that movie, uh, I heard Minister Hussein announced $200 million in affordable housing subsidies for that one project in Toronto. $300 million is what I needed for 5,000 units in Calgary. And so these are the sorts of things where I think we have to be a lot more creative and we have to get out of politics and start to answer some of these problems and some of these questions. Okay, I'll jump in with a, another question. This one is from Hugh Siegel. Uh, he was hoping you could share your insights uh, as to the government, federal government's failure to launch a national basic income program when the uh, benefits uh, for recipients are so readily apparent. Hey, Senator, great to hear from you. I'm still calling you Senator. Um, and you and I have talked a lot about universal basic income. I remain a fan of this. 
I think that the CERB actually taught us how it can work. But I think the challenge is, and you know it as well as I do, is that for it to work, it can't just be an enormous drain on the public purse. And it really does mean that you have to reanalyze a bunch of existing income support programs and in many cases stop doing things that people value. And I think that's the hard thing for politicians. It's hard for us to end things, to start new things. I do think that the experiments that we've seen back in the 70s in Manitoba and the promising experiment that I was very sad to see ended in Ontario before we had all the data um, have really shown that UBI remains, universal basic income remains a policy goal that is worth aiming for, that it does not result in indolence and laziness and people not working, but it also allows people to have that basic level of life with dignity. Because that's the thing about CERT. Were there some shirkers? Yeah, of course there were. Were there some folks who just wanted to sit at home and take the money? Of course there were. But $2,000 a month is not building you a great life in most cities in this country. Uh, but it is at least allowing you to get rid of the pressure and the pain of not knowing if you can feed your kids or having to decide between paying the heating bill or the grocery bill this month. And if we can take some of that psychological stress off of people and allow them to live better lives, I still believe it's the right thing to do. Now, the big challenge we have in the country right now, and no surprise to someone like Hugh Siegel, is that we are in a situation where the federal and provincial governments are unable to get along. And here in Alberta, of course, it drives me insane. You know, our, pro our premier, my premier, cannot make a speech without blaming the prime minister for something. It's just not in him. And ultimately, a lot of these income support problems live at the provincial programs, live at the provincial level. So we actually have a, I do have a degree in public policy. So I think about things institutionally sometimes. We have a problem, which is the, if the federal government funds it and the provinces reduce their income support programs, then they get the benefit of something that the federal government is funding. So without that kind of relationship between the two of them, I don't know how you do it. But if Minister Hussein uh, and... Um, our new Minister of Social Development are able to work together and actually figure out how to do another pilot project and a smart pilot project somewhere. Uh, I think that that would be a huge benefit for generations of people. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to pick up another thread in the conversation here. Uh, this question comes from my colleague, Carolyn, who's asking about uh, the 2013 flood. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, wants to know if you could speak a bit about the lessons learned and the uh, way that the flood may have impacted or modified the approach to planning in the city. Sure, that's another, uh, that's another 35 or 40 minutes uh, introduction uh, to that conversation. I will say that um, over the 11 years that I, well, over the 136 years of Calgary's history, we have declared a state of local emergency a grand total of four times. And lucky me, I got to be the mayor who signed all four of them. So correlation does not equal causation, as I'm forever reminding people. But the flood was a remarkable moment for many reasons. Mostly when I talk about the flood, I talk about the extraordinary community response. Um, and how people came together to look after their neighbors, which was an, an incredible thing. But from a very specific perspective on how we plan and build cities, which I think was the question. Obviously, the issue of resiliency is incredibly important. Now, most people would say that the 2013 flood in southern Alberta was actually not a climate change related catastrophe. It just, it, it has to do with the water systems and the way they work and how close we are to the headwaters here. But what we have seen very clearly is that severe weather events and uh, climate-related catastrophes are on the upswing everywhere. So whether it was or wasn't, it doesn't matter. The point is that you've got to be able to respond in three ways. You've got to be able to have emergency response. You've got to be able to assist people through the recovery. So they're all R's, right? I'm, I'm good at alliteration. And the third one is you've got to build resilience. And so it's that third one that's really important. So here in Calgary, we have just received approval, but remember it's eight years after the flood. 
we finally received final approval to build one of two required upstream reservoirs to store water during flood events and also, well, this one won't, but hopefully the other one will, to store water for drought events, which are actually more common in Southern Alberta than flood events. And, you know, in Manitoba, generations ago, they built a floodway around the city of Winnipeg, which has saved Duff's Ditch, it's called, which has saved uh, Winnipeg from a lot of flooding. But the challenge is, again, short-termism from politicians, which is thinking about making investments now that may not pay off in your lifetime. Like the reservoir that we're building, my greatest hope is it'll never, ever be used. But we have to make that investment anyway. There are some obvious things about planning that also play in here. Um, Canadian cities tend to be built in river valleys because that's where the water is and we're a pretty dry country. And so we have for a long time planned in flood zones in a way that is probably not as thoughtful as it needed to be. And all of the upstream mitigation in the world is not going to solve poor planning around resiliency uh, that is required in individual buildings. You know, the, the province of Alberta, uh, after the flood in 2013, very quickly agreed to buy out properties in the floodway. But the properties in the floodway tended to be very expensive homes. And so now you've got these very expensive neighborhoods in Calgary where there are still sort of missing teeth. And there was never a plan on what to do with those, uh, with those pieces of land or those properties. And so that, it's not that easy. It's not as simple as just saying you can't build in the floodplain anymore because there's already stuff there. But the question is, how do you build up the resiliency? And there are some simple things to do, moving the electrical out of the basement, um, you know, building homes so that they can, they can withstand flooding, making room for the river where needed. Uh, but we're still, sadly, even eight years after the flood in Calgary, across the country, I think at the infancy of thinking about truly climate resilient building codes and how we build in a more climate resilient way. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that uh, much more thoughtfully going forward. Um, so I'm going to uh, carry on with this thread uh, um, related to resilience and uh, share this question from Nalini Naidu, who is a, a graduate of the planning program, and I think she's based in uh, Halifax. So her question relates to uh, regulatory freedom or opportunity. So the pandemic, state of emergencies, urgent decisions, etc., have showed us that regulatory processes can at times be set aside. How can we and should we leverage that as city staffers? Are we at a sweet spot in how we approach municipal regulatory practices? We know we can make decisions quickly and this may be our opportunity to reframe how we do our work. Uh, what a great question. And I think the answer is in the question, which is let's not forget what we learned. I often say, let's never forget COVID. Let's never forget the pandemic and all the lessons we've learned. But specifically for those of us who are blessed to work in government, let's not forget that we can, in fact, answer questions uh, and, and, and not answer questions. That's what I'm doing now. We can make decisions. That's what I'm trying to say. We can make decisions in a way that is much quicker and much less risk averse. Because that's really what regulatory uh, barriers are about. No public servant goes to school or goes to work in the morning and says, I want to screw over a citizen today. But sometimes they get to work and they realize that the policies are only allowing them to screw over a citizen, which is really a shame. And so one thing I worked on for 11 years with my colleagues at the city of Calgary was really trying to figure out ways that we could get the citizen what they needed. You know, the example I always use is back in 2010 in the election, when I was running for mayor, I met a guy who owned a bar and he was complaining about the challenges he was having getting a patio and how he'd been in this process for a year and a half to get a patio permit. And when I was elected and I raised that with the planning department, they said, that's ridiculous. It only takes nine months. And I said, so when's this guy going to get his patio permit? They're like, he'll definitely have it by November. And I said, you know, that that's not that helpful in Calgary. Although it's plus 11 today, uh, not that helpful to have a, a patio in the middle of November. And so one of the first things we did was we changed the patio system so that it was much, much easier to get a patio. Because the question I kept asking is, what are you scared of? What are you worried about? 
You worried that the umbrella is going to fly off and hit somebody? Well, put in a rule that you got to wait down the umbrella, right? This is not complicated. And so we did that. But then, as always, regulatory things are like topsy. They tend to grow. And in the pandemic, we realized that it was actually hard for people to get patios, but we had a rule saying you could only eat outside. And so in a matter of a week, we were able to turn that around and have basically automatic patio permits. And we allowed people to use the parking spots in front of their building or the street to make patios. But we made a mistake. We didn't want the servers to have to cross the sidewalk all the time. We didn't think that was safe. So we put the patios on the sidewalks and moved the sidewalk onto where the parking would have been on the road and put barriers to protect the pedestrians. Terrible mistake. Really hard for people with accessibility problems. And it, it devalues the pedestrian experience. So we made the program permanent but we changed it so that the sidewalk will remain solid and the patio will go in the parking spots. Um, but these are sorts of things that show that we are able to move quickly as public servants, as long as we're outcome focused. Now, I'm not one who says get rid of all the regulations. There's reasons they exist. And when I meet venture capitalists or private equity guys, they're always guys who say, oh, government's so slow, you're so risk averse, I can't deal with you. I always say, listen, there's a reason we're risk averse. In your business, if you make a mistake, well, you're going to lose a bunch of somebody else's money, and then you'll set up a new fund and start again. In my business, if my colleague who's in charge of procuring steel for a bridge makes a mistake, well, people are going to die. And so there is a reason, but that doesn't mean that we can't be smart about it. And I was saying to, the, to Professor Gordon's class earlier that when you're thinking about urban planning in particular, you need a well-designed regulatory system because the free market doesn't work because people can't buy a neighborhood. They can only buy a house. They can only choose from the neighborhoods uh, on offer. And so you need the regulation in place, but you also have to unleash the creativity of the private sector and of citizens in a way that meets what you need to do. So I absolutely believe even after all this time in government, I absolutely believe that you can be smart, you can set the regulatory standards, and you can get the heck out of the way and let the creativity of the people who are putting money in actually work. And so I think that if I were giving advice to public servants now, I would say this is a chance to really break the bureaucracy, to cut the red tape, to use the worst element of the bureaucracy, is, which is we tried that 20 years ago and it didn't work, against the bureaucracy. And actually say we tried that last year and it did work. So let's keep doing that. And I think there's a huge opportunity to do that. Thank you for that. And the question that I'm going to pose, I think probably builds on that a bit. And it ties back to your earlier comments on uh, affordable housing. So Keith writes about uh, the downturn in Calgary's and other Canadian city downtowns. Um, is there an opportunity to recreate them now? Uh, as places for everyone to live, work, and play rather than very high cost, you know, high earning sort of centers. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, again, I mentioned it to Professor Gordon's class, is for decades and decades until about the year 2000, no one would want to ever live downtown. Downtowns were for people who couldn't afford to live anywhere else. And now in most North American cities, downtowns are for the wealthy. The wealthy and the very poor, because you still have a lot of affordable housing projects, but not for anyone else. And so there is absolutely an opportunity here. It's, it's a harder one than most people think. You know, in Calgary, a lot of folks say we're very overbuilt or some folks say we're under demolished. I hate that phraseology, but people use it. And so it seems obvious, you've got all these empty office buildings and you have a need for housing, just convert those to housing. It's not always that easy just because office buildings are built very differently from homes. So where the elevators are, where the staircases are, there's a lot of things to think around, around building code. In fact, um, I just sent a note to one of our big planning bosses, Josh White, a graduate of Queens, used to work in my office with an article I saw about how a requirement for two staircases 
in a, a apartment building actually ruins the design of the building and why can't we have one central staircase like they have in a lot of places in Europe. So there's a lot of things that actually make the conversion of the office to residential harder than you might think. The city of Calgary has an incentive program where we will invest in helping close the gap between a new build and a conversion uh, for private developers. So we're experimenting with that right now. I think that opportunity is more limited than others do, but there really is an opportunity there. And one of the challenges we've had in Calgary is from a strictly commercial perspective, the city is one of the most successful downtowns anywhere. We have a very high proportion of our workforce working in the downtown core. But that also means it empties out at five or six o'clock at night. It's harder for small businesses that have evening business to operate. And so getting more people living downtown is critical. Uh, and hopefully some of that will happen in converted buildings. Okay, I, I've, how are we doing for time? Do, do we have time for a couple more questions, Warren? Or I think two, two one more? Two, one or two. I yeah. can go lightning round. I can be as fast as I can. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm going to um, share this question from from Rob uh, Smith, who's, who's posed a couple questions. So I'll uh, pose one from him. So he's curious about how uh, we could encourage the development industry to increase density rather than develop on the fringes of our cities. How do we convince residents of core neighborhoods to support more and fill? So this relates to what we were just talking about. Oh, boy. So, again, a big question. So essentially think of a city in three tranches, three concentric circles. You've got your center city, you've got existing neighborhoods, and you've got fringe development. All three of them play a role. So in terms of the fringe development, it is possible to build much better suburbs. And I think Calgary is actually a very good example of that. Building suburbs, our brand new neighborhoods now in Calgary are much denser. They're much more walkable. They're much easier to serve by transit. They're mostly a grid design of streets. There's very few cul-de-sacs anymore. Bad for street hockey, good for street life. Um, and they really um, integrate commercial, local retail with living. I I'm very proud of what we're able to do. So yeah, there's always going to be room for suburban fringe neighborhoods. There needs to be, otherwise you're getting to a housing affordability crisis. But they can be built much smarter. The center of the city we've talked about already you, that's high rise living, that's dense living. Most cities are doing well there. The big challenge is the one that was just in the last question about income stratification and making sure you're not just building luxury condos, but you're building rental, you're building uh, opportunities for other people. The economy has helped Calgary in that mode um, of trying to build mixed neighborhoods, even in the center city. The hard part is what was referred to in the question, which is the inner ring of the donut which is how do you work with people who live in existing neighborhoods who love their neighborhood, that's why they live there, and help them be thoughtful about the future and what it could be? How do you help people look at the strip mall at the end of the street with the pizza shop and the 7-Eleven store and say, can I imagine something better there that might still have a pizza shop and a 7-Eleven, but might have room for me to move into as a senior if I want to stay in my neighborhood? or might have room for people who are just starting out to get a foothold in the neighborhood so their kids can go to our great schools that already exist. And that's hard. There's a bunch of technical things around how you do inner city planning that the city of Calgary has been working its way through, creating best practices, guidebooks, doing multi uh, neighborhood plans for how to do that. You got to be able to do it all. The city of Calgary's vision is to get to 50% of all new people moving to Calgary living in established neighborhoods and 50% in new neighborhoods. When I started as mayor, it was between 105 and 125% of people living in new neighborhoods. We actually were emptying out the city, even in periods of extraordinary growth where we were growing by, you know, two or 3% a year, which is huge. Um, so there's no magic bullet to that but it's doing the hard work of getting people used to it. You know, we made it much easier to build the townhouse form, the row house form uh, in Calgary through a new um, land use designation. And in fact, that has become incredibly common to build those on corners in existing neighborhoods in the city to the point where they're not really controversial anymore. They used to be. 
And so it's a plotting step-by-step process, but you can absolutely get there. Uh, The other thing is there's a financial piece, which is in the past, we weren't asking fringe development to pay for the cost of the infrastructure that was needed to serve it, which basically meant everyone else was paying for it. It was an artificial subsidy. We've not entirely, but mostly gotten rid of that so that the market can do its job and people can actually say, oh, there are benefits to buying in established neighborhoods instead of brand new uh, because the costs are more clear and more transparent now. So I'm going to pose one last question and then I will turn it back to uh, Professor Collins and uh, uh, Jocelyn to, to wrap things up. This question comes from Ariel. She'll put you a little bit on the spot, I think. Uh, Mr. Nenji, what's next for you in public service or your next political goal in pursuit of building better community? Well, right now I'm enjoying retirement. Um, That part's been good. Um, I don't know, actually, I have no idea what's next. If anyone has any good ideas, uh, feel free to drop me a line, but I'm easy to find. Um, I don't think politics uh, anytime soon anyway. But, you know, the stuff I said about Seva, about service, to me is really important. And I hope that I'll be able to find a way to use my somewhat limited skills to uh, continue to be part of the story of communities, building great communities in Canada, um, of being able to move forward. Um, I am an academic, by the way, and I keep reminding the university that I'm just on leave, um, that my position is still there. I'm on the world's longest leave, 11 years and counting. But um, so I may go back to the classroom, um, but I may find something else to do. And I'm, I'm just decided for once in my life, I, I like to think of myself as a strategist. I always pride myself on knowing what are the next three or four steps on the game board. Uh, and for once in my life, I've decided to, you know, let the universe unfold as it will. So uh, I'm sure it will. And uh, you haven't heard the last of me yet. Excellent. Okay, I think at this point I'll just turn things over to Jocelyn to say uh, to say farewell and uh, and I think she's still on the call here. Yep, yeah, we're still here. All right, uh, <laughs> Mr. Enchi, thank you so much. Um, as a born and bred Calgarian, and on behalf of the Policy and Planning Program at Queens and everyone else who was able to attend today, um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and share all of your valuable experiences and expertise. Thank you. So thank you so much. Um, We will wrap up now. I want everybody on the line to know that we do keep track of all the questions. We'll be passing them along uh, to Mr. Nenshi so that he can see the full breadth of questions. There were lots we didn't get to. I'm sorry. I hate when we don't get to them all, but I'm I'm very verbose. Uh, There's lots there and we would have, we would have needed a few hours and uh, on Zoom, that's a lot to ask, but Uh, We're just delighted you were able to be with us. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. And we'll look forward to another conversation down the road. Thank you all. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody.